Welcome to the Soda Podcast and welcome to Season 1 of the series In Conversation With. Just like good data helps the world go around, so do good conversations. Your host is Martin Mascheline, CEO and founder of Soda Data. In this series, Martin will be in conversation with practitioners, technologists and change makers who all share a passion in making meaningful connections and rethinking traditional practices. They'll be talking about data, what makes their world go around and sharing their thoughts, perspective and ideas that we think will inspire you to be a part of the conversation and be a part of the change. Without further ado, here's your host, Martin Mascheleyn. Hi, everyone. I'm Martin. I'm the CEO of Soda Data, and this is In Conversation With. Today, I'm delighted to welcome both Arif Wieder and Max Schulze. Arif and Max are known because they met, uh, they connected, and they also decided to write a book together on one of the most talked of or talked about or sought after topics and methodologies in today's data world, and that is Data Mesh. So today is a conversation about data mesh. And I'm very keen to have this conversation because data mesh is probably in more than half of the conversations we have with data leaders today. And I personally like it a lot because it provides a framework for data teams to think about how they can grow and mature their organization to be more effective with with data. And it's a quite opinionated piece as well that talks about both the social dynamics as well as the technical architecture. So today's in conversation with Arif and Max, they will talk about their experience of working together. They'll talk about their experience in the data space, but also, of course, their book, uh, which is Data Mesh in Practice, How to Set Up a Data-Driven Organization. So let's start off uh, with some introductions before we dive in. Uh, Arif and Max, uh, welcome to In Conversation With. Uh, I'm delighted that you're both here. Uh, Could you please introduce yourselves? So what should we know about you and what makes you a great listen for the podcast? Absolutely. Uh, Yeah, great to be here. Um, Thanks for um, hitting this off today here, Martin. Um, So uh, yeah, my name is Arif. I'm... uh, I used to be the um, head of um, data and AI for ThoughtWorks Germany. So I was uh, working in um, consulting full-time um, for uh, quite a few years, um, working a lot with um, data teams on the ground as an engineer um, and uh, often leading those teams, um, trying to help data teams to kind of get out of trouble. And now um, the last two years, I um, went back to academia and I'm a um, yeah, full professor of software engineering um, still continuing to work um, as an both independent consultant and as a fellow consultant with ThoughtWorks. Yeah, this is really what I what I do these days. And um, actually, um, yeah, to be honest, uh, data mesh um, is still the topic that keeps me busy pretty much every single day uh, for the last three years. I would say it's it's the topic um, that um, that I'm yeah busy with all the time and trying to help as many. Uh, clients, uh, people, um, conferences, etc. With awesome, and you, Max? Yeah, also from my side. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, it's uh, it's really amazing uh, to get this chance uh, to to speak to such an amazing uh, audience as well. Uh, from my side, um, I am actually having like somewhat of a similar background uh, to, uh, compared to Reef uh, when it comes to the engineering space, when it comes to the data space. I've been a, a data practitioner for almost a decade now, um, mostly with a background both on the engineering side, but also specifically on providing data platforms, um, but more focused on specifically working in bigger organizations. Um, I'm... I came from a background even back in university where I was already getting the chance uh, to be lucky enough to get to participate in working on Apache Flink uh, because I was uh, built directly at my university and that really kicked off my interest in data really, really early. Uh, And then after some some initial endeavors, I ended up at Zalando, uh, Europe's biggest online platform for fashion. 
And um, I've been working there as a data engineer for uh, for many, many years, starting to build up the first version of the data lake of the company um, and eventually transitioning into a leadership role where I'm now also working as a data engineering manager that's responsible for essentially the storage layer of the data lake of the company. Also at that time, of course, running into a lot of issues when it comes to building data platforms, when it comes to offering data platforms um, to a larger organization. And that's what also directly drove me into the hands of Data Mesh as well, where ultimately I also met Arif uh, and um, from where we started uh, going on to common endeavors and really start publicly advocating Data Mesh uh, and yeah, creating content in the Data Mesh space for almost three years now already. Awesome. Arif, you said something that piqued my interest. You said a fellow at, uh, or fellow with ThoughtWorks in Germany, that was, right? Can yeah. you tell us more, a bit more what that means or what that entails? Yeah, um, yeah so the, the thing is, um, when I um, we made, the, uh, made the move back to um, academia um, two years ago, um, it was uh, really important to me to be able to um, not only stay in touch with industry, but actually also to stay in touch with um, ThoughtWorks as a company and also as a community, because this is really um, a very exciting tech community and it has always been. Yeah, because of that, um, I um, talked um, to the folks at ThoughtWorks um, when I decided to take on the professor role and um, we agreed that um, I can continue working um, for ThoughtWorks. Of course, um, in a different capacity um, because uh, I do the full-time professorship, which means um, I'm only allowed to work um, up to 20% of my time in industry. But um, luckily, this is um, not only allowed by my university, but also encouraged. Awesome. Well, I think we've, we're bringing a lot of experience, but not only kind of in the world of data engineering, but much broader. Uh, to the table today. And that's what I'm really excited about. Uh, we'll go into kind of the practical side of data mesh, the implementation, like the real life um, uh, things, you you know, the, the roadblocks, I guess, you hit or the experiences that you have. So I'm really excited to dive into those. Um, Max, maybe I want to follow up on on your story, on your background. Um, is there anything in, in your career in the last couple of years maybe that, or even further back, that had a very important kind of life-changing or impactful, maybe even defining moments that you want to talk about? Oh, definitely. Like the, um, the thing that I that really pops to my mind uh, immediately there is um, the point in time when I made this transition towards leadership. Because that was like really the point uh, where I was transitioning from doing a lot of hands-on things in the data space um, and really like building these things for direct impact um, for the people that were then using them towards actually transitioning uh, into a role that was scaling the impact to a much, much broader thing, being much less hands-on, still getting the chance to tinker around with some ideas in like architecture discussions with the team and stuff like that. Uh, still really enjoy that. But getting the possibility to actually inf influence a, a big company in a much broader scale. And this was like really exciting for me. And it really came with two different facets. On the one hand side, of course, now being responsible for a team um, and getting the chance to actually also work with other very gifted individuals, help them grow and see their trajectory over time. That was uh, incredibly exciting and uh, uh, really, really motivated me. But at the same time, again, the part where uh, I would almost say um, I switched my my team lead hat off and I put the data mesh hat on uh, when it really came towards like influencing the company as a whole in terms of the direction that we are taking with data. This very much went into like areas like defining a strategic outlook, right? This went into directions of sitting with individual teams and actually helping them to follow up on some of the things that we had been discussing and preaching for quite a while. And yeah, really starting to make things happen uh, in like an end-to-end -end way, not just focusing on like dedicated technical features, uh, but really bringing this to a broader scope within the company. So how did you guys meet? What's the story there? When, when, when did this all get started? 
Yeah, I mean that's actually pretty simple um, because, as I said, I, I worked as a as a consultant full time with ThoughtWorks, mm-hmm. um, and that is pretty much how we met because um, I was um, leading a team at Zalando. Um, so Zalando uh, was um, the client uh, of ThoughtWorks at the time and still is. Um, and um, in fact, we were not working in the same team, or yeah, not um, not directly. Um, but uh, I, I I somehow knew of Max, and um, because uh, he was somehow involved in kind of um, getting us there, uh, or specifically, I think uh, organized a meetup where um, Emily Gorchensky, who is now the head of um, data and AI at ThoughtWorks Germany, spoke, and then somehow this ended up um, us uh, being at at Zalando. And pretty often when I worked at clients. Um, uh, for ThoughtWorks, um, I was often seeing great things, right? That that people build great things, that people um, create great things, or follow fantastic practices, etc. Um, and um, so, yeah, I have this almost kind of a tradition that um, I usually then then picked someone from the client and said, "Hey, um, yeah, uh, this is pretty cool what we're doing here." Um, shouldn't we um, talk about this publicly or write something about this? And um, yeah, and in this case, um, data mesh uh, was just a pretty new topic at the time, like really new. Um, and uh, I knew of Max, and Max uh, was um, already uh, leading many of the um, kind of data infrastructure efforts at the time at Zalando. So um, I think I just um, uh, shot him a message, and then uh, we met um, in the Zalando office and were brainstorming uh, what we could um, talk about. Awesome. It's great to hear that uh, Zalando, it's it's a success story in Europe, so that it has served as the kind of the incubator or the kind of the innovation center for this to all uh, to all start and uh, that that's all possible. That's really great to hear. Now, tell us a bit about or tell the listeners a bit about where you guys uh, are located and, and maybe, you know, before we dive into all the data mesh uh, specific topics. What are some favorite things you like doing outside or other than data mesh? Yeah, maybe I can I can uh, take that one on first uh, before handing over to Arif. Well, first of all, we are both actually in Berlin, uh, Berlin, Germany, um, and that is also where Zalando is actually sitting. Uh, so that was, of course, fueling uh, the initiative that uh, we took upon ourselves here. But um, I have to honestly say, like I was. I was born in Berlin. I grew up here, went to school, university, like the whole journey. Um, and I'm super happy that I actually got the chance to, to, to spend my life in this amazing city. I still love it. I still very much love that it has an incredibly international environment where there's like so many people from so many countries all over the world. Uh, it started off a lot as like, a, um, I think there was a slogan at some point that said something like poor but sexy. Uh, where like it attracted a lot of people that just came here to, to meet, to party, to uh, like spend all the nights out. And I was very much among them uh, and very much enjoyed that. But by now as well, um, Berlin has become a lot of a tech hub as well. Uh, and like it has drawn in a lot of uh, big name companies as well uh, that now started building up like tech hubs uh, within the city, again, fueling the international environment because they are, again, like bringing out, bringing in a lot of international talents that then come into the city and, again, continue um, uh, building up this amazing international environment. One thing maybe to throw in from me from a personal side, um, I'm a huge gamer. Uh, I love playing games, be it like board games, card games, video games, console, mobile, whatever. Uh, like you, you can shoot anything at me and I'm, I will get excited, definitely. Um, I was even traveling around for many years playing Magic the Gathering on a competitive basis uh, and playing like major tournaments with thousands of participants like all over Europe uh, and sometimes even beyond that. And I even got to meet my wife that way. Awesome. That's very cool. And you, Arif? Yeah, um, it's also pretty easy for me um, to answer the question, kind of what uh, 
uh, yeah, keeps me intrigued outside of data. And that is most of the time coffee, to be honest. Mm. I'm really quite a coffee geek, if you can say so. Um, so yeah, I'm always looking into the newest uh, gadgets and uh, gear and stuff that you can have about coffee. So I have... Uh, an espresso machine and different grinders and uh, different techniques and uh, stuff to do your hand brew and um, always uh, look for um, different uh, coffee to get. Uh, whenever I travel, I basically just look uh, look up the best coffee shops to go to. Um, so this is pretty much uh, what what uh, yeah what I'm really into. Nice. But be honest, Arif, the coffee is also what actually keeps you going in the data space as well. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, Max, if someone were to visit Berlin, what is the one thing they cannot leave Berlin without doing? So, I already mentioned that it's like super international environment. And I already mentioned that this, of course, also for a very long time brought in a lot of people just to like party hard. Um, I definitely would say you have to experience the nightlife. Like there's so many amazing clubs, there's amazing bars in various parts of the city. Um, like it, it really doesn't matter where, like where you end up, you will always find some place to actually be around. But be careful as well. A party rarely starts before midnight. So like usually people like meet and warm up with some drinks, maybe meeting like early as a 10 or so. If you go to a club before midnight, A, there's a good chance it's still closed. But B, like, even if you get in, the dance floor is probably empty. Yeah. So, like, there's even a good saying, like, where has been the night from Friday to Monday? Uh, because people, they really enjoy their party in Berlin. And I can absolutely recommend doing that as well. Yes, I can't say I've never partaken myself. I've learned that there's a thing called day partying in Berlin. You just basically go wake up in the morning bright and early at 7 a.m. And that's really prime time. So, uh, I've heard it's, uh, I've heard it's amazing. Yes, definitely, definitely. And you know, you can just get up at seven and go party and meet the people that have already partied the whole night through. So <laughs> Nice. Well, I'm, uh, I'm sure we've uh, given our listeners some inspiration. Um, and it's, I definitely recommend going to Berlin. It's in a fantastic place. But enough about Berlin. So one of the key reasons we wanted you guys on the podcast is because of the book. So it's called Data Mesh in Practice. So how to set up a data-driven organization. And it was published, if I'm not mistaken, in 2021, right? So uh, last year, O'Reilly. Um, first question, how did you come up with the idea to write the book? Um, that's actually pretty uh, pretty easy. So um, we, I think we gave a talk at um, the Databricks uh, Data and AI conference um, Three years ago, I guess, or two years, I don't know. 2020, COVID, I think. Uh, kind of mixes with your sense of time. Um, and, uh, and I think as one of the effects of this talk, um, we were approached by O'Reilly first to um, give a series of trainings um, about data mesh. Um, online live trainings. And I think then um, at some point, I don't know, after the first training or something, we were approached by O'Reilly again um, if we were interested in uh, writing a little book. And um, that's when we talked about this and thought that might be a good idea. That's very cool. There's, I think, a, a various degrees of understanding what data mesh really is and definitely how to apply it. Um, so I think there's still quite some interpretations as well. Um, so how do you guys think it should be understood or how would you summarize it? Well, it's actually quite interesting because like, as you mentioned, right, there's, there's like, it's a huge hype and a huge buzzword and like everybody talks about it, but rarely anyone actually understands what's the meaning behind it. And, um, but what, what is actually pretty important from, from my perspective is that, you understand what are the, the principles that actually stick behind the term. Because like ultimately, like Data Mesh is trying to address data at scale from an organizational angle. And it's really like trying to, to, to ask people to make more conscious decisions about like how they are dealing with their data, um, who's owning data, who's responsible for data. 
um, and to really turn data into something that is tightly integrated into the value generation chain of a company instead of, um, well, coming from the situation that uh, that many companies have been in for way too long or still are, where data is provided somewhere as a byproduct of some applications, ends up in the storage layer, sometimes even by accident, gets picked up just because of random, and somebody starts building a production use case on top of that. Right. Uh, that unfortunately is a situation that like many companies are still in. And I don't want to lie, for many cases, that's still the case for us as well. Uh, but this is really where like data mesh is asking you to turn around on how you're actually thinking about what you're doing with your data and to put in the conscious effort and to turn around uh, and really make it a proactive work with your data to really get the best out of it and get the value that um, the data actually ingrains. Yeah, yeah. I think the 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 one thing that I the one message that I always want to want to bring home about um, data mesh is that it's about people. I think I've given quite a few talks uh, with exactly that uh, title, um, and I think also Jean Marc uh, recently is is um, pushing that point quite a bit. That she is always emphasizing that data mesh is a social technical um, approach. Um, so. In fact, I would say data mesh is not only about people, right? So technology is really an important part of data mesh. Um, but I think it's very easy to um, see data mesh as kind of a successor of maybe the data warehouse or the data lake paradigm. Um, but this means that you come from purely technical approaches, and then you think data mesh is the next technical successor to that. Um, but that's really not what it is, right? Um, data mesh really adds the, um, the people uh, perspective to it. And this is really the important thing there. It is really um, a, an approach that, um, or a paradigm that really looks at ownership structures, responsibility structures, uh, interactions between people, um, and not only how data is stored, how data flows, etc. That makes total sense. The people part has always been, I think, the hardest. Um, and especially at a time like this, where the data space is evolving so, so quickly. Uh, so it's very, very hard for, for a lot of uh, people to keep you know, up with all of the latest and greatest, all of the changes that are happening, all of the dynamics in the landscape. Um, and it must have also been for you guys a uh, uh, very interesting journey. I remember from one of our uh, other podcast series, uh, Data Dream Team, uh, Jesse Anderson, who is the host of that, he had a conversation with Zamak and she was talking about um, how interesting it was to be kind of at the bleeding edge, writing about all of these concepts and having to kind of distill and make them very as easy as possible to um, explain and share um, so how difficult that journey was. And I'm sure that for you guys, it was very similar when you're kind of implementing this, you're at the bleeding edge, you're, there's some theory, but the practice and theory there, I think there might've been a big gap. So is there anything that you want to share that you've learned while implementing, um, kind of data mesh into practice? Well, the interesting thing is, and, um, that is also something that, uh, that, Jamak once mentioned to us is that data mesh is nothing that has been like freshly invented from the scratch and just popped up out of nowhere. But much rather, it's something that already developed in many, many companies at the same time. But ultimately, Jamak did us the favor to give that thing a name so that we actually have something to talk about. Right. And this is honestly also how the whole Zanando data mesh journey started um, because we looked at what was proposed in the original article and we realized that there's actually quite an overlap to things that we are already doing. And that was actually also where, uh, even though that was like really early after the, the, the name tag uh, became public and uh, started to, to be talked about quite frequently, we got the chance to already gave, uh, give uh, the, the talk that I earlier mentioned um, to talk about our practical experiences because it was not just about, hey, 
now there's this data mesh thing. Let's try to actually make that happen. But it was also much more a reflection of where do we actually stand already? What are the things that we have already done? And now that we actually have something, some way to call that, um, how can we reflect on these experiences and share them with others so that we uh, can give some practical advice as well um, to, to the rest of the community around that? That makes a lot of sense. Um, if I really want to hone in on this people part. I'm uh, also super, not curious, but I think it's a, it's a core aspect. But before we do that, um, I want to know a bit more about the book. Um, so without spoiling it for any of our listeners who haven't read the book yet, uh, take us through a high-level summary. Um, what are some of the key kind of points you're making? Uh, what are the key steps that companies need to go through when setting up a data-driven organization? Uh, maybe some stories. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, I think like one of the key points of the book is the the practical experiences and the practical examples that we have actually thrown in there. But generally speaking, um, the book is uh, is built up in, in, in two main chapters. The first one where we talk a little bit about like the whole background about Data Mesh, like where it's coming from, what it's actually about, what are some of the problems that it's addressing as well. But then we try to turn that around and shift gears and say, well, how can you now actually get started? Like how, how what are the things that you can dive into, right? And like, even going through the different stages on how a data mesh uh, develops within the company, right? Really from the first steps that you are taking, um, the, the first things that you're getting involved with, some tips and tricks on really how to get started from, from, from square one. But then like developing this further and like how can you actually scale the mesh once you have like made the first steps in your organization up until the point where you really dive into how can you sustain this over a longer time. And um, again, like one of the one of the selling points, I would say, is like a lot of small practical examples uh, that we've thrown in there. A lot of um, yeah pitfalls and uh, um, and best practices that we have encountered uh, through various uh, different organizations that we have been talking to over time. And um, that is really like where we where we wanted to build that up. And maybe we can even like share a small like anecdotal story uh, when it comes to that. Um, to to sh showcase one of the practical examples that we have integrated there. Yeah, I mean, I think we we um, called it um, data mesh in practice for a reason, right? Um, uh, there are other books um, about data mesh that kind of simply um, explain what data mesh is, um, and uh, yeah, really, we really wanted to um, uh, go a bit deeper into how do you do um, data mesh. Um, and yeah, I think what is really at the at the core of the book is this um, data mesh journey, right? And the different um, stages of this data mesh journey, because as we know, this is really um, a, a journey that will probably take um, several years. Um, so um, there are really very different problems and different challenges um, that you have at different stages of that journey. Um, and this is really what we what we look. Um, into um, from a very practical, um, hands-on perspective. Maybe, maybe going a bit on the tangent here, but um, uh, I think like uh, just reflecting on one of the practical examples that, that we put in there for the purpose of like making the things that we are trying to convey just like more relatable to the people, right? Um, one of the examples that we put in there, um, and again, those are somewhat made-up examples, but they are too close to reality <laughs> to just push them aside. Uh, and this particular one uh, that maybe I can share is um, about a um, about a data analyst that joins a team um, that has been working in a technical setup for quite a while, an engineering team, and they were measuring also some KPIs uh, of like how their services are doing. And now with this analyst joining, for the first time, this team was in the situation that they wanted to build some KPIs that did not only rely on the um, on the data that they were producing by themselves, but also on some data of another team. And um, this analyst got pointed towards a contact in that other team, and they reached out and they were asking for 
well about that data, about that service that the data was coming from, um, and about how they can use that. And they got pushed back saying, no, we are not responsible for this and we don't know how to help you. And uh, yeah, so they just had this new job and a new team got this first appointment. And after two weeks, they were already stuck. Uh, trying to then talk to the colleagues again, they learned that there was a central data lake team and um, that central data lake team might be able to pick up the conversation and to help them. So they reached out to the central team and Conveniently enough, again, it took them some time to actually get an initial response, but um, conveniently enough, uh, they actually got a hold of someone that was able to sit with them and to actually help them and to dig deep into, for instance, finding this one data set that was mentioned before that they wanted to use for their KPIs and identifying where it was actually coming from. And who would have guessed the original owner of the application on where the data was coming from was, in fact, the very first team that they already talked to. Now, with that knowledge, they again reached out to that team. And um, then that respective team realized that they screwed up, um, that, in fact, this was within their area of responsibility, just that there has always been one person that was taking care of that service and that had all the knowledge about that service and that person had just left the company. So they were in this amazing situation that um, they did not know anything about that anymore. Um, the analysts, well, they were stuck in the situation and they had to actually figure out like what to do there. But ultimately, it took them six weeks or so to actually find the right data that they actually wanted to have for their particular use case and to be able to use that. And to, in the end, fulfill a job that took them less than an hour to actually make it happen. Right? And this is just one of the stories that, again, way too close to reality. I've seen many, many things like this happen all the time everywhere um, to just like showcase how important it is not only to look at the technical parts around the data that you're working with, but to really understand the, the people component. Right, the, uh, the part of ownership, the part of responsibility, and to really like ingrain into working with data um, and yeah, owning the data so that you are actually able to also extract the value from the data in a reliable fashion in such a company. Yeah. So I think it's really kind of uh, those, those real world stories that are usually about actual people, the problems of actual people that that really inspired uh, large parts of, of the book. Um, so I don't know, I think this, this particular story of mine is not shared in that way in the book, but it's kind of the one that I have, have seen again and again that as part of my uh, work as a consultant, it, it happened so often that I came into a central data team or a data team with central data responsibility and they were so buried in firefighting work, basically, and um, couldn't innovate at all. But uh, yeah, we're really just facing the complaints of um, what felt like the entire company. And they got blamed that nothing is working anymore and nothing is moving anymore when it comes to data, etc. And um, it's it's really this um, pretty bad situation of um, of central data teams that has um, influenced um, yeah many of my uh, ideas about this. I think this will be very relatable to to many of our listeners. Uh, striking this balance between uh, agility uh, but also stability, uh, I think, is a, is a very difficult one to strike, uh, and it's very often also, I guess, not visible in the organization. Um, as to how much time goes into all of this firefighting. In, in the past, I think this problem would, to some extent, um, be kind of tackled with uh, what we call data governance programs, right? To various degrees of success. Well, let's keep it at that. Probably some a little bit less successful than, than we hoped. How is data mesh different to, to data governance and Maybe as an extension to that, are there any lessons that we can learn from these data governance programs from the past? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Um, one of the biggest things to say first is that data governance, of course, is a part of data mesh. 
right? Um, the approaches that data mesh is taking might be very much different compared to these uh, central data governance programs that you just mentioned before, where somebody was like running around more like a data governance police uh, that was like... Uh, um, with a stick behind the teams, trying to force them to actually take care of some of the rules that they had made up in their ivory tower. Um, of course, we have seen many times that, as you mentioned, to various degrees of success, rather on the lower end on that side. Uh, but um, this is exactly the part where, where Data Mesh tries to turn it around and take a more um, a more decentralized approach as well to on the one hand side, generally the concept of like data ownership and data responsibility, but to deeper ingrain that into the culture and to not um, have, again, somebody run around with a stick and force the people to do that, but to actually build incentives for people and to prove to the business as well that there's value behind having people actually take on their responsibility about data. And of course, there's a whole governance aspect to that as well, like uh, that comes through things like the moment you start decentralizing things, that means um, you there's a high risk that you will start building up a lot of silos, right? There's like a, a real risk that things start like drifting apart and starting to move into like totally different directions. And this is, of course, something where, again, you need to really make sure uh, that you catch those things early and you make sure that there is still enough alignment for the cases where it really matters. And this is where also the governance side in, in Data Mesh takes a much more federated approach, uh, where you actually bring in different, uh, different individuals from the respective domains um, to, well, have their say and to, to, to speak to each other on a regular basis um, to understand what are the global concerns that go beyond just the scope of their respective domain. You want to keep the things that belong into one domain and that only concern into uh, inside that domain. You want to also keep them inside of that. But for the things, uh, because that enables, again, agility and speed and actually allows people to move fast, right? But for the things where there's like touch points between the domains, where there's concerns that go beyond that, there still needs uh, the, the needs to be the possibility um, to connect those people as well with each other and to actually talk about that. Arif, is yeah, there I anything think, that you want uh, to maybe add specifically for the for the automation part on that? Yeah, yeah, I wasn't, I was indeed uh, about to go a bit into that. Um, so, I mean, governance is um, basically about making people do the right thing, right? I mean, governance should really be about, I don't know, um, uh, data protection policies, those kind of things um, that are really important, right? Um, and I think the the important thing about data mesh is that it's all about ownership and responsibility. So the idea is to not force people to do the right thing, but instead create a responsibility and maybe also incentive structure um, so that people are aware that they should do the right thing and they feel responsible to do the right thing. And um, the important thing here is that um, you support the people in the right way, right? Because um, it doesn't help to just say, hey, you have to do this and you also have to do this and on top you also have to do this. But instead, it um, needs to be really easy to do the right thing and um, you need to get as much support as possible. And so this is um, where this whole um, computational um, federated governance um, aspect of data mesh comes in. So um, the idea is to um, give as many tools to people um, that allow for a certain amount of automation. So to give, a, um, uh, give, give one of um, several possible examples, um, the people on the ground who own the data, who create the data, etc., cetera, um, they know what's in the data. So they are the ones who can, for instance, um, say, hey, this data field here, um, this really needs to be encrypted and secured very well because it contains important uh, personal information, etc. Um, so they're the ones who really know what's in the data and how it should be treated. Um, so now the thing is, those people, they need to be enabled to 
tag the data, for instance, accordingly, and somehow use their knowledge about the data to say, hey, this is important here. But they shouldn't be the one who need to think about the details, how that encryption is happening, etc. So they need good tools so they can simply use their knowledge, make good use of it, say this piece uh, of data here uh, is um, kind of uh, sensitive um, and um, they know how to tag it, what to do, and then uh, they need to be able to rely on automation and on platform um, uh, that um, the right things are then um, done with the data accordingly. That makes a lot of sense. So you're creating a, a platform which could be a platform for people, but also for tools, uh, so that the different teams and parts of the organization can do the right things when it comes to data, and they can do it on their own. They could do it in a self-serve manner. Um, that will be yeah. my summary of, of, of that. Does that make sense to you guys as well, or? Would you add Absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So now we have that mission. What can go wrong when uh, when we're doing this? And I'm I'm sure there's a plethora of things that can go wrong. But what would you want to share with our listeners that are embarking on this journey? I guess we can start off just with like the the most basic thing that is probably the earliest that people can be doing wrong as well in their journeys, which is. Um, not actually understanding what data mesh is about. <laughs> like like starting and embarking on a journey or like based on just like hype and buzz and uh, and start running without actually really understanding what's the direction that you're taking. And um, like I always love to, to, to summarize it as like do not commit to the buzzword but commit to the pillars behind. Uh, and this is like super, super important as well that you actually need to understand and like have deeper conversations as well with some people around you to really reflect on what is the what is the real meaning of the principles behind it and especially what is the real meaning of those in the context of your organization because like one of the most important things to realize is as well data mesh is different in every organization like every everyone has their own very specific needs for their field of work uh, and that differs from from org to org, from company to company. Um, and first figuring out what does data mesh actually mean by the book, uh, but then also reflecting on that and understanding what does it mean for your company. Um, that is like one of the one of the first steps before you really want to get going. And we've seen like many companies like do that mistake and. I have to frankly say we did the very same at Zalando as well, of like trying to name something data mesh at the very first step when the whole thing just came out, um, and then realizing that this is not a good idea. Only like a year later, when we reflected much more on where this journey is actually taking us. I mean, data mesh is a um, honestly a pretty advanced. Um, paradigm and a set of pretty advanced practices. Um, so I would say there is also a certain level um, of maturity that you as a company already want to have before you go into data mesh. So if if you have a company um, that um, really is very early um, in their experience with product thinking, for instance, um, it, it's really hard um, to go the next step already and think about data products. You first have to have a good idea of how do you do um, product management and product development at a company uh, before you can get into the even more complex topic of building um, data products and do data product management, for instance. And, and just to share like another like small anecdote uh, from, from one of our trainings, uh, there were like people that were approaching us um, who were like all, yeah, like this whole data product thinking is really nice, but how can I do this federated governance now? And I'm like, well, maybe at first you need to understand that one builds up on top of each other and that you cannot just start making your governance federated if not even your central team knows what that truly means. Um, but even more so if your decentral teams have no idea how to work with data in the first place. And, and that was like really, we heard a lot of people that try to like jump ahead of themselves, um, really like trying to first build the platform before they even have the first use case, or even especially because, again, a lot of companies have governance issues, 
And they heard there's a new kid on the block that talks about something, something governance. Uh, so that is the one thing that they try to immediately jump to. There's already quite some uh, very, very good recommendations in there. Um, not getting ahead of yourself, um, not caving into the buzzword lingo, not uh, and really studying the different concepts and and doing some form of maturity assessment on the, the the different areas. Like if you're mature in one, but maybe not as you said, if in product thinking or in product management, um, that could lead to pitfalls. Um, so that's very very helpful. Any other things top of mind uh, that you would share? Other um, either lessons that you've learned or that you're still learning that that you want to share with the audience? So I think the, the thing that we also keep repeating again and again, but it is really important, is um, that, that we believe it's important to start small, right? Mm. Um, I think uh, you usually need some uh, some form of, of management backing in order to, um, uh, to um, successfully um, do such a cultural transformation. But nevertheless, it's really important to start uh, start with a really specific use case. Um, start with a team of motivated people who really want to change their way of workings, who um, yeah, who are um, happy to to challenge uh, certain things, um, and then create a small lighthouse project, lighthouse example. Um, on which other people in the company can then look at, right, and uh, and see, hey, this is interesting um, to do things in a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe then the people from that from that first team can share uh, how things work better, or maybe what specific challenges were. Um, and this way, you can really kind of um, tell a story, tell different stories, um, and um, yeah, um, drive this um, culture and those practices. Uh, through a company, but um, it's it really doesn't work if you um, if you, for instance, create a huge uh, platform project um, and plan for twelve months platform development and then a six month rollout of the platform for the whole company. Right, so it's it's far more important to look at a specific use case and and you also you want to have um, advantages already after. Three to six months, right? Um, this isn't this isn't about kind of a huge um, upfront investment. Um, you this is more a marathon, right? Um, you will need to stick for it for quite a while, but at the same time, you already want to reflect on it uh, a couple of months in, and you want to make sure that it's already working for you to some extent, and that you already get something out of it. I think that's great advice for uh, organizations that are taking on data mesh. So uh, start small, do it end to end. Make sure you have business value as early as possible. Uh, I think those are great points. So, are there any particular roles in uh, that are most impacted by data mesh? I would say, well, first of all, uh, the uh, not very fair answer is probably all of them. <laughs> but uh, of course, there are some that are that are much more impacted by others, right? Like on the one hand side, um, the engineering teams that are now asked to actually take on more responsibility about the data that they are producing, um, they would very much be affected as well because they might need to pick up a new tool or two and like expand their skill set to actually go a bit deeper into data in general, especially when they're coming more from, let's say, a software engineering background. And now they are really asked to take on some challenges around data. The most important role, I would say so, is probably going to be the data product manager. Uh, like this is really like we have emphasized uh, product thinking for data quite a couple times already today. And um, it is really important that you have somebody in the teams that has this on top of their mind all the time, that is like experienced in product thinking in general, but also is becoming more and more an expert in the data space. And this is really to understand where the value from your data is coming from, to really understand your stakeholder landscape. Um, to be able to communicate with them on a regular basis, to to understand what they need, uh, like like what is the impact that you're actually having on the rest of the organization, and to use this input as well to prioritize the work within the team, right? And and this this is really what I would say is probably the role that's the most impacted by that because that is the one that is 
essentially driving the adoption of data ownership and data responsibility within the respective teams. Um, and that's the one that really needs to understand best where the business impact is actually coming from that you are trying to reach with the services that our, you are offering, uh, not just from an IT side, but specifically also from the data side. Yeah, I would I would very much agree with um, with that assessment um, that it's really the um, data product management that is most affected uh, simply because that role usually doesn't exist, <laughs> so so it needs to be created, uh, and it's and it's incredibly hard um, to build up those people, to be honest. Um, and uh, you cannot find those people because um, this is just being developed now, right? So you want to look for people um, who have an interest in data, in data and analytics, um, but who also um, have experience or an interest in product management. And then you want to bring those um, two sides together, right? So you can, you probably need to look for people who have experience, prior experience uh, with either of the two sides um, and then see how you can build up um, the other side, right? So that is that is really um, a, a pretty tough one, but an, an important, very important one. And every time that that we manage to successfully build up those people, um, companies uh, have been have been very grateful and and happy um, to have have those people around. Um, another role that I would still um, mention is actually that of the data scientist. It's not. Um, I mean, it, it might already be affected before introducing something like data mesh, but um, let's say, um, depending on the maturity of your company, um, there are still a lot of companies where data scientists um, kind of work in kind of an isolated matter or way um, in their little labs or pockets or so. Um, and they're not kind of integrated in um, general engineering uh, practices um, such as continuous delivery, um, checking all your work into version control, um, uh, yeah, versioning um, your models, your data, etc. Um, and um, I think, uh, yeah, data mesh is actually not not really talking about this much. But um, in a uh, fully functional data mesh, um, there is no way around um, integrating data scientists um, with um, all the other uh, engineering and, and product roles. Um, and um, depending on the company, this can be quite a big shift um, for the data science role. That makes sense. And I'd love to double click on the data product manager role a little bit. Um, so if you already mentioned that um, it's in most cases not there yet, uh, my assumption would be, of course, in companies that uh, deliver software products, you'll have more product managers, so you might have an easier time to find them. But if you're a, not a software company, uh, you might have a harder time. Um, Ideally, it's somebody that has uh, one of both uh, skill sets, so either uh, product management or in data. And I, I guess it could be a variety of uh, backgrounds or roles in data. Would there be any other um, thoughts or recommendations, maybe even a high-level job description, or just to help our listeners kind of more think about or visualize what that role uh, would actually look like in their in a day-to-day um, how they can look for or find these people within their organization. Any pointers there that come to mind? Yeah, that, that is a tough one. Um, so from my experience, I would probably start to look for people who have a passion for um, product development or um, basically people work, right? Um uh, so I would probably first look for people who who don't mind talking to stakeholders, understanding um, the the needs um, of um, of customers and uh, and consumers, um, because this is kind of what you need to have a have a passion for, right? Um, that you try to understand what the what the needs, what the desires of um, uh, of other people um, usually within the company are, right? Um, and then I think you can um, ideally look whether 
among those people. Um, there are some that are also interested in data. And if not, you can try to upskill them on that side. Um, of course, it can also work the other way around. Um, but um, I think it's it's really important that you find people who, who like to work with people uh, and um, are not only um, enthusiastic about data and data technology and uh, analytics results, etc. Max, anything you want to add there? Well, I can also speak a bit from, from, from my experience here in the sense of, on the one hand side, we were lucky enough uh, to some extent uh, to be already more on the side that you mentioned before, that we had already been a pretty product-driven company at that time. So like even a lot of the, let's say, software engineering teams um, that were providing a lot of the data, they already had product support for the parts of the services that they were providing. Right? And from that angle, of course, it makes it easier to take somebody that already has the, the product thinking, already has a network internally of like stakeholders that they are regularly communicating with to, to upskill them on the data side and have this the new thing to, to actually introduce them to. Then um, as a reset uh, to, to have it the other way around where um, you have some people that might be passionate about data, but they are more focused on like technology and like diving into the details and uh, really being interested in the analytics of, of the specific facts that they are actually looking at. Um, for, from that angle, I think like we've always been like on, on, the more lucky side, let's say, um, uh, to to start that journey. Of course, we are, we are growing as well, right? Like like there's new teams that are being built up, and there's again also people that we need to bring in from the side, or that we need to like newly introduce to these roles. And I have seen people as well that were coming from a data engineering space or from a data analytics space that started to move into product as well. And again, like one of the, the, the biggest traits that Arif also highlighted, um, those were usually the people that were very interested in people, you know, in, in like working with people and like communicating all the time um, in, in like understanding and trying to dig deep into what their stakeholders actually need. So from, from that angle, um, yeah, the, the, the experiences are really matching here from my side as well. That makes tons of sense. So what will the topic of the second book be about then? So one of well, the things think... is um, we have to admit this is not like the fully sized book um, that you would expect on a topic like this, right? On the one hand side, of course, we've uh, written it rather early throughout the development of the data mesh topic in general. But that also makes it a great intro point, right? I think like it has now reached a size in the format where you can easily like run through that in a day uh, and get like a very good grasp on what the topic is about and what are some of the key points that you need to start thinking about um, when it comes to reflecting this on your organization. Now, the interesting part is, of course, uh, we are curious to dive deeper into that. Right. Uh, since we wrote the book, there's still like plenty of practical examples and practical experience that we are collecting each and every day when applying those things in practice. And um, as you might have noticed, we are very curious uh, individuals to also share these things with the community and with a broader audience. And I think like it's really important to to reflect on these things as well again after a certain amount of time and after the topic itself has matured but also after the organizations that we are working with uh, have matured in their adoptions of the topics. And I think like one of the biggest points um, that we want to follow up on is really to, to continue outlining the journey and to, to start gathering more and more practical input as well. And again, share these practical examples with the community and turn that around so that people can really have something tangible uh, that they can work with, that they can touch, uh, and that they can really connect with when it comes to applying these things to their own data mesh journey as well. Yeah, yeah. I think as, as, as Mark said, kind of uh, the, 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 the second book will probably be the, the first book in an extended ver uh, version, um, kind of fleshing it out um, at various places. Um, because, um, yeah, we are experiencing so many interesting challenges um, as we work uh, with different people, with different companies, um, and they are just really very interesting, interesting questions. Um, like, 
uh, I don't know, um, uh, how do you build uh, consumer-driven driven contracts for the output ports of a data product, right? Really going into detail um, and uh, sharing best practices and uh, maybe pitfalls. I think this is really what we what we want to go um, deeper into. Awesome. And of course, because of Arif, we also have to bring data mesh to academia. Oh yes, of course. <laughs> Very <we> nice. <laughs> So later in this series, uh, we'll have a guest from Google's site reliability engineering team uh, join us. And we're going to dive into the pillars of site reliability engineering, but also how it applies to the data space. Um, Arif, do you have any views or perspective on this that you want to share? Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, in fact, uh, I think um, Jamak has also often um, said that data mesh is um, to a certain degree about bringing engineering uh, principles or practices from operations engineering um, to the data space, right? And so this is actually, uh, Data Mesh is a lot um, about bringing um, things that now have a name, which is site reliability engineering, um, to the data space. So I think it's, um, Data Mesh is a lot about um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, yeah, working professionally, so to say, um, with data um, and uh, building contracts, for instance, right? Or um, also building um, service level agreements, um, uh, those kind of things um, about data, right? Um, and I think this has, um, as always with Data Mesh, not only a technical component, right? So it's not only about um, describing um, a technical contract um, as with an API or so, um, but it also has this um, uh, semantic component, right? Where you really uh, maybe also want to write a document about um, the assumptions that you have um, about the data, right? How do you expect the data to behave, to develop into the future? Um, how often is that updated? Um, how reliable is that particular stream, etc., right? And um, of course, it's great if you can um, uh, formalize many of those things and then maybe even automatically um, check those parts of a contract. Um, but I feel that uh, many of the things that you need to talk about um, in data um, cannot be, or it's pretty hard to check them automatically at this point in time. Um, so I think it's still worthwhile to also just write down um, your expectations um, and, uh, and your assumptions about data and um, agree about that with your data stakeholders, right? So, so this is really the important um, point there. An analogy that I, that I often um, use is that a um, federated data governance team, as we envision it in, in Data Mesh, um, as Max said earlier, uh, shouldn't act as a data governance police, but more, I would say, like a notary, right? Mm -hmm. Like basically someone who um, helps... Uh, a discussion between two parties, between the data consumers and the data producers, and um, help them uh, create a good contract, right? Kind of help them to ask the right questions, kind of helps that the right things get included in the contract, etc., to prevent uh, arguments later, right? Um, so this is what a good notary is doing. Um, and uh, I think this is uh, kind of an important um, part of this um, SRE idea, but as you see, um, again, bringing it um, also a bit more to the, to the people aspect. That is very interesting and definitely something we second or echo at, uh, at Soto. We've been... Um, Tirelessly working on making language for these expectations uh, available for kind of all your producers and consumers. So really resonates uh, with me as well. Very good. Awesome. So you've mentioned the term data product, and I've personally struggled a little bit with that. Uh, data products, 
um, in my head, in my mind, is a finished product. It's like a um, a machine learning model, for example, that's kind of driving a feature in your application, or it's a dashboard uh, that your operations teams or analysts are using. Um, when I read Data Mesh for the first time, it start it explained data as a product, and it explained that we should so we should think of a data set or of data as a product, and therefore. How I understood it was that the data sets that we, for example, as a data team, publish on the mesh, um, that those are products in and of itself. And I'd love to hear if if you kind of share that opinion that there's some confusion, or is it something that's very clear cut in, in your minds? Yeah, so you're not the only one struggling um, with that with that term, uh, and it indeed there's a lot of confusion um, about about that term data product. So first of all, um, you're right. the The key idea about the data product is that um, product thinking is applied to data, right? Um, so in this case, I would even say that, for instance, if you only appro- apply um, SRE uh, site reliability engineering principles. On a data set, um, that is not a data product because you haven't applied um, product thinking. And um, the latter, I think, is even more important. Now, where the confusion comes from is that, as you said, well, if I build a machine learning model or a dashboard and I apply product thinking, um, then this must be a data product, right? Um, And this is indeed not the case. And the second term that I usually introduce here is actually that of a data application. Um, And I usually um, say that you have data products and you have um, uh, data applications that build on top uh, of data products. And now the way or what is distinguishing a data product from a data application is that you have not only applied product thinking on a data product, but you have also invested in reusability and uh, composability. And that is the thing which you do not do when you build, for instance, a dashboard, right? Um, a, A dashboard, you can build it as a great product, but you don't build a dashboard so that another dashboard can be built on top of that dashboard, right? And this is really the thing. So uh, what what creates that confusion is that um, uh, data mesh has this organizational aspect to it, uh, where all the product thinking, etc. comes in, but it has also this architecture aspect to it. And as we say, the um, architectural um, uh, uh, what is it? Um, the architectural quantum um, of data mesh is that of a data product, right? And this idea of an architectural quantum um, that only works when you uh, make that investment in making this uh, a building block, right? Um, and this is exactly what uh, what makes a, a data product. A data product is a data set, or it can also be a, a machine learning model, um, something. Um, that is providing data where product thinking has been applied to and that serves as a building block um, to build other data products uh, of it or um, build uh, data applications on top of it. That is super helpful. Uh, we'll change my vocabulary to start using data applications uh, now. So that makes uh, makes a ton of sense to me. Thank you for that. Sure, you're welcome. Very good. Arif, Max, thank you. It's been a great conversation. A few points I'm taking away is the difference between data products and data applications, what to do next time we're in Berlin, and how to start with a data mesh initiative. Start small, prove value early, and take it from there. It's been fascinating to hear how you guys have put Data Mesh into practice. Thank you for sharing that with our listeners. Thank you for sharing that into the data community. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to talk to you here. Yeah, it was great to be here. That was a great conversation. When our peers share, it's an opportunity to listen. Where others have tried, where others have succeeded, we can learn. Oh, for the power of trusted relationships in this data community. 
join the journey and get connected. Follow Soda to be the first to know about new conversations as soon as they drop. We'll meet you back here soon at the Soda Podcast.